when Chief Ho called me at 12 o'clock and said, you have to go to the hospital because Juan's been in a car accident, uh, my husband and I couldn't, we thought, well, he's broken a leg and he's going to be really upset with himself because he doesn't like to be debilitated in any way. And I just couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. And when Chief Hogue held a press conference on that following Monday, I burst into tears in front of all the media. It was all the cameras there. And do you remember, Chief, how I felt like such a loser? I went back to my office and I thought I had just done the worst possible job as mayor, that I had not served the people of the community well by showing such emotion and crying in front of all the cameras and just not being in control of myself. And so I remember sitting in that office feeling so low. And then later, in about a minute, I was feeling so low, I got a phone call that they put through from a police officer who said, thank you for showing us how much you care about us. And then Chief Hogue told me that that was the sentiment of the police department. And so then I learned that it's okay for a leader to show authentic emotion. And that started my bonding with the police department in a way that I had not ever imagined that I would. And then Corporal Mike Roberts, who was killed on August 19, 2009. And then on June 29, 2010, when Officers Kokab and Curtis were killed by Dante Morris, and we had a four-day manhunt for the killer. By that time, Jane Castor was the police chief, and this was someone who Chief Hogue had recommended to me. And I thought that Chief Castor was a good chief. But in those four days that I worked with her so closely as we looked for Dante, as the police and all the law enforcement looked for Dante Morris, I saw in her a person who became a great police chief. I saw a complete straightforward leader in Jane Castor in the way she conducted herself and the way she led and the way she brought together everyone from the command. We had the FBI and the Secret Service and the Fish and Wildlife game, everyone. SWAT teams, K-9 teams, people from all over the state and all over the country. She coordinated it all, and she really is the epitome of the kind of straightforward leader that I talk about in the book. Those were really tense days because we felt that anything could happen. We knew that he had nothing to lose, and so we really felt that he could easily kill another police officer or kill an innocent member of the public who got in his way while he was being captured. And what a rock was lifted off of our shoulders the, the night that I got the phone call that he was captured. What I learned more than anything else from the death of the police officers, I learned about resiliency. I always thought I understood resiliency before, about how you get knocked down and you pick yourself back up, how you suffer defeats, get fired from a job, lose a loved one. But what I saw with the death of the police officers taught me more about resiliency and about people. I don't think I'll ever forget it. You take people like Kelly Curtis and Sarah Kokab, they live anonymous lives. They're not people who are used to the public spotlight, having cameras or WMNF with a microphone in, next to you. They're not used to that. One night they get a phone call in the middle of the night and they're driven to the hospital of Tampa General, blaze of lights, and they're there, they're taken to a room where we tell them that their husband has died. And in the case of Sarah Kokab, she was nine months pregnant. And in the case of Kelly Curtis, she was the mother, they were the parents of four boys, age eight months to eight years. And Jane and I looked at each other that night in the hospital and we said, can it get any worse than this? Can it get any worse than this? Then I'll tell you about resiliency and the way those wives conducted themselves in the days after. In the public glare, a state funeral, three weeks later, Sarah Kokab gives birth to a stillborn. And Jane and I visited her in the hospital. And we talked to her, and she was exhausted. And she said to us, you know, tomorrow morning, Dante Morris is going to be arraigned for the first time, and I want to be there. And we said, well... We understand that you want to be there, but it's okay if you can't be there because he's going to be in court plenty more times. He'll be in court lots of times. You'll have lots of opportunities to make sure that you honor your husband's memory. She just kind of looked at us. And sure enough, that next morning at 9 a.m., when Dante Morris was brought into court in the rain for the first time, Sarah Kokab was on the front row with Kelly Curtis. 
the very next morning. And I looked at that and said, now there is the resiliency. That's the kind of person I admire, right? You know, so often as a public official, you're asked to fill out things for media and for inter magazine articles. Who do you admire most? And I guess years and years ago, I used to name figures, historical figures. Oh, I admire whatever, Abraham Lincoln. I admire John F. Kennedy. Forget all that. Those are not the people I admire anymore. I, they're great. They're great. There are books, all kinds of books about them. I do admire them. Let me correct that. I admire them. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, Abe Lincoln, two thumbs up. <laughs> the people I really admire are those in life who show resiliency. I admire the Iraqi war veteran who comes back in his James Haley Hospital and loses legs and still has that resilient spirit, you know? I admire the wives of the police officers who, when faced with something so terribly tragic, just find that leadership that is within <coughs> them. And that's what helped inspire my book because I said, you know what, people have leadership within them that they don't see themselves. So many of you in this room, you don't see it in yourself. But as after 26 years of public life and my last eight years as mayor, I saw in people, I saw that person who would come down to City Hall very tentative the first time and ask for something. And six months later, they were leading a civic organization. They found that leadership within themselves. The Crime Watch people, we saw that. People tired of the drug dealing in their neighborhoods, and the next thing you know, they're leading a march down the street. I loved it. People have leadership within themselves, and that's what I want them to see. And I hope that in this book that they can help, they can see themselves that everyone's a work in progress, and they can develop those leadership qualities. I was a reluctant candidate for mayor. I got in at the last minute. Some might recall that. I don't know. And I really, really wasn't sure that I wanted to even run. And uh, I wanted to finish out my duties as supervisor of elections, and I wanted to touch screen. You might remember that high-tech touch screen that we had before we... Whatever. That's another story. That'll be another book I won't write. I won't write that one. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I, I had pretty much decided that I wasn't going to run. The election was in March, the qualifying was in January, and this was December. And, you know, I had to buy a Christmas tree. You know, I had to <coughs> celebrate Christmas, have two children, husband. <coughs> and uh, I got a call one day. It was like December 16th, 17th, so it was late. And this person was a person I respect, and he was going to counsel me. I had already decided not to run. And, and he said, you know, Pam, we don't want you to run, we, whoever these we were, people who cared about me, because we don't want to see you go down in defeat. We'd hate to see your political career end that way. And there's this other person who has all this support, and this one and that one, and, and, and he's going to run a campaign, air, sea, and land, like the Normandy invasion, I guess it was going to be. And he has the support of everyone, and the election's pretty much already decided. I'm sitting there thinking, wow, can you imagine telling the supervisor of elections that elections aren't going to decide? That's not smart, huh? I haven't counted any votes yet. I still believe. So, you know, he, he said, you know, you've had a great career. We like you. This just isn't the right race for you. And if you get in, you're just going to lose. Wow. <laughs> Got off the phone. Mark, where are you? Found? Oh, not. <laughs> <laughs> Just like at home. <laughs> I'm running. <laughs> and so I turned to him and I told him about the conversation. And I said, that's it. I'm running. Now, I don't you know, recommend that that's the way you make decisions on an emotional basis like that. But don't you hate being told you can't do something mm -hmm. you know you can do it? Doesn't that really bug you? Mm -hmm. It's a yeah. cinder block. No, if some, yeah, right. Well, it's like the cinder, cinder block with Al Barnes. Yeah. You remember Al? No, I no, you don't. didn't go I to River Hills. To Temple Terrace. You didn't, okay. Yeah. Well, you know, 
If someone were to tell me, Pam, you can't be a physicist, I would be the first to agree. I would line up, and you're right. I don't understand all that kind of that kind of part of this mathematical equations. Although I do know how to balance the city budget, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but when someone tells you that you can't do something when you know you can, right? Mm -hmm. And so I said, hey, the heck with this, I'm running, and I'm going to win. And uh, you know who I competed against? Myself, right? I've always had a rule. We've all, Fran and I have always had a kind of a rule in, in politics with, with all my campaigns. It doesn't matter who the competition is. And you don't spend time talking about the competition. You talk about what you're going to do and how you're going to win the race. And I think that's always been a key. So I ran for mayor, and I'm really glad I did because I was able to pull together a great team, and I hope we made a difference. More importantly, I want to help inspire other people to find that leadership within themselves, that leadership that we all have, that resiliency that we have, that strength that we have, and not wait and look for someone else to lead this community in this country. We have a tendency in our society to think that one person is going to come in and solve the problems, right? But that's not really the way America works. We build this country neighborhood by neighborhood and city by city and each state and then collectively it makes a great country. And I think if more people develop their leadership abilities, if more people really worked on inner leadership qualities and recognized what they had within themselves and first led themselves well, they could then lead their families better, their community, their businesses, and even enter politics and make a difference. And that's what I hope people gain from this book. Now, being used to a life of politics, I'm used to questions, and I'm happy to answer any. Carla, do you usually have, is this a question and answer format typically? She's selling books. Okay. <laughs> Does anyone have a question for me? Yes. I was noticing the uh, yellow cover book standing in front of